Guys, I don't know what's real or what's bullshit, but I found this PDF online, and it's called The Origins of the Kabbalistic Tradition of the Golden Dawn by Thomas Stakowitz. 2008, 2009, 2010. The Golden Dawn tradition is the result of a synchronistic effort to unify different branches of the Western esoteric tradition within a Kabbalistic Kabbalistic and Hermetic framework, using the Rosicrucian mythos and teaching as the unifying agent. The Rosicrucian traditions, which found themselves being united in the inner order of the Golden Dawn, the Ordo, Rosi, Rubea, Et, Aurea, Crucis, RR, Et, AC, mainly came from two English and two German branches. One of the English lineages which found their way into the Golden Dawn was the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, SRIA. Two of th three founders of the Golden Dawn, namely Dr. William Robert Woodman, 1828 to 1891, and Dr. William Wynne Westcott, 1848-1925, were elected to be the Supreme Magus the title of the highest chief of the SRIA. Similarities between the Golden Dawn and the SRIA can thus superficially be seen in A, the threefold order structure of one, first, second, and third orders, B, the office of the chief adept, C, the general design of the cloaks of officers, see figure one, D, some of the designs of the wands, Look especially for the ceremonial wand of the Supreme Magus, with colored bands, which seem to be a blend between the Lotus Wand and the Fire Wand of, of the Golden Dawn. See Figure 1. E. The cross design of the Supreme Magus, surmounted by the crown, which bears striking similarities with the cross design on the lid of the Pastos of the Abdetus Minor Grade. Compare Figures 1 and 14 and F, some basic designs for the Vault of Adepts, even though the SRIA version is not as detailed and evolved as that of the Golden Dawn. Figure 1 is W.W. W. Westcott dressed up in his Supreme Magus Regalia. Furthermore, with some further research, one will also find influences from Sigismund Backstrom's Societas Rosai plus Crucis, SRC, more obviously seen in the Adeptist Minor Oath and the design made by Moina Mathers on the Second Order Membership Roll, see Figure 2. But perhaps even more subtly, so thorough, some of its alchemical teachings. So while there are obvious influences from these two important English Rosicrucian currents into the Golden Dawn, because of its close proximity to the British esoteric community, I still consider them to be of minor significance compared to the continental sources behind the first and second orders of the Golden Dawn. The very chief of the very foundation for the second order was received through S. L. McGregor Mathers. Uh, McGregor Mathers, by the way, was uh, Alistair Crowley's um, top influence. Uh, I believe that was his teacher. Uh, Mather's secret chief and envoy from the Third Order, mysteriously referred to as Lux E. Tenebris, who handed McGregor Mather's 1858 to 1918 all the material he needed to found the RR at AC in 1892, such as the Adeptus Minor Ceremony and Ritual Z, and probably the major the major bulk of the rituals from A to Z, but it is an established fact that also the first or outer order, at least in part, was founded from a similar mysterious envoy of the third order half a century er earlier through the mysterious cipher MSS, which W.W. W. Westcott received from the estates of Kenneth R.H. Mackenzie. Figure 2 is the seal on the membership roll of the R.R., at AC left and that of the SRC right. 
there is strong evidence which supports the assertion that the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, in fact, is a continuation of and stems from the oldest known Rosicrucian organization, referred to as the Fraternitate Rosai et Arii Crucis R et AC, with earliest documented records from 1580 and by some claimants even as early as 1517, see below, which seems to have had early lodges in both Italy and France during the 17th century. This Rosicrucian body later resurfaced, resurfaced in Germany in 1710 as the Orden des Gilden und Rosen Crucis, heralded by Samuel Reichter, who was known by his pseudonym or magical name of Sincerus Renatus. This German order of, of golden Rosicrucians went through several reformations during the 18th century, now referred to as the Gold und Rosicruz Orden, and under the leadership of Hermann Fichtuld in 1757 and 1767, and lastly through a general reformation in 1777 by Fobron, or Dr. Bernard Joseph Schleiss von Lohenfeld, which changed its orientation entirely into a Masonic framework. There it is in its workings, referring to it as Gold und Rose Kreuzer des Alten Systems. The Golden Rosy Cross has been a major influence on later modern Rosicrucian organizations, besides the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, no doubt because of its publication of the Geheim Figuren der Rosenkreuzer, or Secret Symbols of the Rosicrucians, in 1785 such as the SRIA and even later American Rosicrucian recreations of the 20th century. According to Jean Pascal Rougui, the acknowledged French scholar on Rosicrucianism and the Golden Dawn, some of the rituals and wand designs of the Second Order actually derives from the Order of the Golden Rosy Cross in his highly interesting and original article, Rosicrucian Alchemy and the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Mr. Ragui has the following to say. It must be underlined that the rituals of R.R. and A.C. were not entirely created by McGregor Mathers, but that he was inspired by those of the German Golden Rosy Cross, which I am sh quite sure he received by regular transmission. Indeed, I have the proof that the Golden Dawn wand's patterns were inspired by Moses' wand, described in a very secret and old German document of the Golden Rosy Cross, dated 1514, a copy of which is in my possession and that I received from the internal college of this order. It is quite interesting to note that this document contains strong Polish-Jewish Kabbalistic influences, and especially those coming from the school of Shabbatai Zevi, who proclaimed himself in 1666 to be the Messiah awaited by all the Jews. This date, 1666, is very interesting because it is in accordance with the solar cycle of 111, for instance. It was in 1777 that this order was reformed with a new scale of grades, which was to be adopted both by the SRIA and the Golden Dawn founded 111, or 111 years later in 1888. Now in the Golden Rosy Cross document, which I referred to above, contains also many rituals which we find once again in the Golden Dawn. For instance, several versions in Latin and in Hebrew of the Kabbalistic Cross ritual and the Middle Pillar ritual. By the way, uh, be on the lookout in this channel. I'm going to read Israel Regardi's The Middle Pillar. So that's going to be out in this channel. That's sort of why I'm reading this document to sort of prep and um, get some context um, for halfway through that book. Also, if you haven't listened to um, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, I read that book, and that's, that's worth listening to. Although... Nobody really talks about this, but at the end of that book, it was kind of talking about all the ways that um, 
everything that um that that he found was sort of bs or faked or at least it could have been so just take all this with a sense of with an air of, of skepticism um but it's kind of interesting nonetheless so let's get back to the document so this document constitutes the proof that the Golden Dawn magical rituals are in fact the developments of those of the German Golden Rosy Cross, but as these latter rituals are still very secret, it is also proof that the founders of the Golden Dawn received a genuine German Rosicrucian transmission. Mr. Rugu, sorry, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. I don't know how to say that. Mr. Rug, Rugui in his paper also claims the existence of a French golden rosy cross lodge in 1624. In this quote, we see a reference to the peculiar branch of the Sabbatian Kabbalistic tradition, which brings us to the subject matter of this essay. Thus, in the context of the Kabbalistic tradition, I would like us to turn the attention to another Rosicrucian organization, which had an even greater impact of the Golden Dawn tradition than that of the Golden Rosy Cross, namely the Asiatic Brethren, a short form of Brotherhood of St. John, the evangelist from Asia and Europe. The organis this organization later changed its name into the Ritter and Bruder des Licht, or simply as the Fratres Lucis, or Brotherhood of Light. The unique character of this organization is that it took not only the amalgamation of the Hermetic and Kabbalistic traditions even further than the Golden Rosy Cross, but that it is more distinctly than ever before took its Kabbalistic influences from the peculiar Polish version of Sabbatian Kabbalah into its fold. Jean Pascal Rugiu thus continues, The original Fratres Lucis, or Brotherhood of Light, was founded in Germany by the Baron Ecker von Eckenhofen, a past member of the Golden Rosy Cross and also founder of Asiatic Brethren. All these German fraternities were deeply involved with the practice of alchemy. My historical researches into these topics proved that many members belonging to the Asiatic Brotherhood of Fratres Lucis became members of a, gold, of a German Masonic lodge called Le Aurore Na Naissante, or the nascent dawn, founded in Frankfurt, Am, Am, Maine, in 1807. Westcott wrote that this lodge was a very ancient Rosicrucian lodge of Frankfurt on Maine, where Lord Bulwer Lytton was received into data adeptship. We will return to the topic of the lodge, Le Aurore Nascent, in a very in a short while. But I would like to point out that the Hebrew name of this lodge, or the Shevra Zerach Bekur Aror, was also identified by the Jewish scholar Gershom Sholem as having some high-ranking Frankist Sabbatian members. All these Kabbalistic influences originated from the Asiatic Brethren. David Griffin writes the following in his article, did W. Wynne Westcott try and steal the Golden Dawn's legitimate Rosicrucian lineage for the SRIA, in which he claims a direct Kabbalistic transmission into the Golden Dawn through the Asiatic Brethren? The Asiatic Brethren was a schi schismatic Rosicrucian order founded in 1780 by then member of the Gold und Rosicruz order Hans Heinrich, von Ecker and Eckenhofen, 1750 and 1790. Interestingly, the Asiatic Brother Brethren was a Rosicrucian order which allowed Jews among its members at a time that anti-Semitism was rampant in Germany. Among its Jewish members figured prominent Kabbalists from the heretical sect of Sabbatai Zevi, such as Ephraim Hirschfeld, unknown to 1819 and Thomas von Schoenfeld, whose real name was Moses Dobrutschka. Thus, the Order of the Asiatic Brethren holds a unique place in the history of the Rosicrucian tradition, as having fully developed its Kabbalistic aspect for the first time. Interestingly, the Sabbatian Kabbalah of the Asiatic Brethren 
is of exactly the same nature as that later founded in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. But the Sabbatian sect in Poland of 1777 mentions in the quotation wasn't exactly of the same nature as that pr professed by Zabatai Zevi or Shabtai Zvi, 1626-76 and his prophet Nathan of Gaza, 1643-1680. The Kabbalists of the Asiatic Brethren were actually Frankists, or in other words, followers of Jacob Frank and his very radical and antinomian versions of Sabbatianism. Jacob Frank, or Yekov Lieb Frank, 1726-91, was regarded by his followers and himself to be the next avatar the reincarnation of the Messiah, Sabbatai Zevi. This Frankist sect soon became notorious and branded as heretic by most Jewish rabbis because of its stance against organized religion, Hebrew, Christian, and Islamic alike, as representing the shells, Klipoth, who entrapped God. Thus it was the task of the Jewish Kabbalists, according to Frank, to convert to Christianity who he referred to as the sons of Esau, i.e. the Edomite kings, and thus free God or the divine sparks from its imprisonment in the Christian religion, as they had already done with their own Hebrew religion. Hence, Frank's followers converted to Catholicism and mass. They, this they did in the spirit of the holy apostasy of Sabbatai Zevi, who was forced to convert Islam in 16. 66 by the Turkish Sultan Mehmed IV, and figure three, that is Sabatai Zevi. Sabatai Zevi had a brief carrier as the Messiah, which was expected to free the Jewish population of the diaspora from its exile and prosecution. His mission suddenly emerged in the wake of Polish persecution of Jews, and the fact that the majority of the Jewish diaspora believed him to be the real Messiah in 1665, in the wake of Nathan of Gaza, proclaiming him as such. Zevi soon became a threat to the Muslim community in Turkey, where he had held, where he held most of his ministry, and was forced to convert to Islam under sword point. Following his apostasy, Zevi joined, joined the Bektashi Sufi order, which resulted in a blending of Islamic mysticism with the Kabbalah. Man, all this stuff gets so, like, mixed around. Like, I, you know, I don't know very much about Sufi. Um, I know it's Islamic mysticism, but then they mixed with the Kabbalists. Kabbalist is Jewish. So, I mean, you know, I'm trying to figure out where all the origins of this religious stuff is, but it's just all jumbled and mixed together. And so you just don't know what you're getting now in modern days. Like you have to like trace the origins of every document that you read. And then of course, as we're finding out that the origins of those documents lead back to other stuff. So it's just, it's never ending. But don't worry. I'll read through it and I'll summarize it. Just listen to me. <laughs> don't do that with people. Use critical thinking guys. All right. Anyway, just keep listening to me. This holy apostasy was likened by Nathan of Gaza as the descent of the Messiah into the mouth of Samael, Satan. What? Okay. So, the holy apostasy was likened by Nathan of Gaza as the descent of the Messiah into the mouth of Samael. Oh, late, um, by the way, guys, Aleister Crowley, I always heard this term, like, was he a Satanist? I googled it, and I, I read some things. You know, he didn't believe in God. He was kind of an atheist, and so he took on the sort of sat the Church of Satan type of attitude to uh, towards viewing God and all that stuff. But he practiced all this like magical stuff. Uh, so he believed in entities and obviously summoned Iwas and everything. Um, so he believed in some higher powers, and he was trying to invoke Semiel, which is a version of Satan. So was Alistair Crowley a Satanist? No, he didn't believe in Satan, but yes, he was trying to invoke, like, evil beings and evil demons and stuff. So, I don't know what to believe. I, I thought I didn't like Crowley for a long time, and then I started to read some of his 
No, I don't like reading his actual work. I like reading work about Aleister Crowley. And the work I read about Aleister Crowley, if it's positive, makes me, you know, view it like in a good light. Like, okay, yeah, maybe he was onto something. Maybe he had some some good um, things to say, you know, finding your true will and um, all this stuff, uh, t- having a conversation with your holy guardian angel and all the you know, interesting things. But when I hear other things that he was trying to summon Samael and things like that, it's like, Man, maybe I don't want to mess around with this guy. So I don't know what to believe. That That's where I'm at right now. I, I don't know what to, I, you know, as a general rule, I don't believe any of this crap. It's just interesting for history. Um, okay, sorry. I, I, I will try not to go on these tangents again, but this is, you're watching what you're watching, man. Um, <laughs> later, Sabatai Zevi created a following amongst the Turks called the Donme, Turkish for convert, who seemed to exist even today. As an ethnic minority, though although fully integrated with the Turkish population and outwardly living as professed Muslims, Jacob Frank was in fact initiated into the Sabatian Kabbalah by the Turkish Donme circle that emerged from Osman Baba Barucia Rousseau before he later entered his missionary life in Poland. Figure four, Nathan of Gaza. The Frankists, who had a large following in Poland and other Eastern European countries, also engaged in sexual practices through some form of sexual mysticism. They embraced sin not as sinners but as saints to free the sin in sp- the spark of God from the clipotic clip- shell through indulgences or integration. But we have to remember that Sabatian Kabbalah follows the teachings of Isaac Luria, or Arziel, where matter is suspended in a fallen state, mixed up as it is with the klipoth, the shells or husks from the first and aborted creation, which gives matter its characteristics as it is known to us today. The goal is restoration, or tikkun ha-olam, which means that matter is submitted to an alchemical process of separation of the gross, the klipoth, from the fine, and the creation of a new Eden and a new Adam or Christ. Lurian, as well as Sabatian and Frankist Kabbalah, is unanimous in its message that the spark of God, which is entrapped within the shells, klipoth, must become liberated, redeemed, for this restoration to occur. Obviously, the Frankist Kabbalah was highly controversial, and it's no surprise that it was soon also to be banned by the Catholic Church, and Jacob Frank himself imprisoned as a heretic, even though the Christian Church at first had supported Frank's followers in their apostasy. Little did the Church know that what we see here in Sabbatism is an urge to unite all Abrahamic religions into a coherent whole. As a matter of fact, the Frankist movement tried to institute a new form of universalist, universalistic messianic religion and considered Christianity as an intermediate stage towards it, with Jacob Frank himself as the next avatar, a reincarnation of the Messiah, Zabatai Zevi. Figure 5 is Jacob Frank. These universalistic universalistic tendencies could later be seen in the Asiatic brethren who baptized its Jewish members with Christian names and gave its Christian brethren Hebrew-sounding names. This perennial tendency within the Sabbatean Frankist Kabbalah has survived with the Golden Dawn, which blends many different Western religions and pantheons into a coherent whole. Furthermore, more, the Asiatic Brethren was also celebrated both Jewish and Christian holidays, and therefore incited the Jewish followers to break Hebrew law, as for example, eating pork with milk. This was clearly an antinomian practice that surely was inherited from the teachings of Jacob Frank through people like Moses de Brusca in uh, 1735 to 1794 who was the cousin, often referred to as the nephew of Frank, also known as Junius Frey and Thomas von Schoenfield. In his book, Kabbalah, from 1978, Gershom Sholem says, 
Moses, the son of Schoendel de Bruschka, Jacob Frank's cousin, who was known in many circles as his nephew, was the outstanding figure in the last generation of Frankists, being known as Franz Thomas von Schoenfeld, a German writer and organizer of a mystical order of a Jewish Christian Kabbalistic fig, uh, character, the Asiatic Brethren, and later as Junius Frey, a, Jacobian, a Jacobin revolutionary in France. So as can be seen, the Fratris Lucis, or Asiatic Brethren, was basically a splinter group of the Golden Rosy Cross, Gold and Rosenkreutz order, which, as with the former organization, blended hermetic and Kabbalistic notions into a coherent Rosicrucian philosophy. But as the Golden Rosy Cross seemed to lay a greater emphasis on hermeticism and alchemy, the Asiatic Brethren, on the other hand, laid more emphasis on Kabbalah and magic. One other great difference between these two organizations was that the Golden Rosy Cross, in vogue with mainstream German Freemasonry, was restricted to Christians, while, as we have seen, the Asiatic Brethren permitted both Christians and Jews as members on an equal basis. These universal Universalistic tendencies and openness to both Jews and Christians can also be seen in the later Freemasonic Lodge in Frankfurt am Main, founded in 1807 and referred to as the Juden Lodge. Actually, Gershom Scholem was one of the first modern scholars to identify this lodge as the La Aurore Naissant, or Chevra Zerach Bechur. IR. It is a well-known fact that prominent members of the Asiatic Brethren were involved in the creation of this Jewish lodge, and it became the heir to the tradition of the Asiatic Brethren. What is interesting in the context of the subject matter of this essay is that there exists quite convincing proof which substantiate the belief in a true esoteric transmission from the Frankist Kabbalah into the Golden Dawn. Reading the first folio page of the Golden Dawn cipher, MSS, one will find the words Shevra Zirak Abakur in Hebrew, which directly relates to the lodge identified in Frankfurt by Gershom Sholem as the Shevra Zirak Bekur Ayer. Interestingly enough, these Hebrew words translate to the society and the rising light of dawn. Uh, this is figure six, first page of the cipher MSS. So on one hand, we have a clear association between the Sabbatian Frankist Kabbalah La Aurora Naissant through the Asiatic Brethren, and on the other hand, a link between La Aurora Naissant and the Golden Dawn through the mysterious cipher MSS. I believe the most plausible intermediary between Frankfurt M. Main of 1807 and London of 1888 to be Kenneth R. H. Mackenzie, 1833 to 1886, who received his claimed Rosicrucian esoteric transmission in Austria by the hand of the Hungarian Count Apanyi in 1850. It is more or less an established fact that the cipher MSS was written in Mackenzie's own handwriting. Mackenzie also spent all of his childhood and most of his adolescent life in Austria and returned at the age of 17 to London, together with this esoteric transmission. He was also one of the few men in England who was up for the task in the same way as MacGregor Mathers, was the only man suited for the task of receiving the second-order material from the Continental Adept, referred by him as Lux Ex Tenebris. Figure 7 is Kenneth Mackenzie. Strangely as it seems, William Wynne Westcott claims that the Rosicrucian Mackenzie upon ye connection was the true origin of the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia, Anglia SRIA. David Griffin also has the following to say regarding Mackenzie. In his 1947 paper, The Origin of Our Rosicrucian Society, the Freemasonic scholar Bruce Wilson reveals an astonishing discovery. It turns out that Kenneth Mackenzie actually 
had been initiated into a Rosicrucian society and had indeed received a warrant from Count upon ye. Furthermore, Mackenzie did actually use this warrant to found a Rosicrucian organization, but it was not the SRIA. Wilson reveals that the warranted organization was none other than the first phase of the Golden Dawn as a branch of a continental society called the Brothers of Light. This is a reference to the Order of the Asiatic Brethren, also called the Ritter und Bruder des Licht, or Knights and Brothers of Light. Thus, Mackenzie reused the name of Fratres Lucis for his own English member of the Rosicrucian body, also known as the Society of Eight. This is what we see here is a clear esoteric lineage and transmission from the Frankist Sabbatian Kabbalah, which constitutes one of the pillars of the Kabbalistic teachings of the Golden Dawn. The other pillar is, of course, the more recognized Christian Kabbalistic tradition, which stems from Renaissance philosophers, such as Giovanni Pico della Mirandola. We know about that guy. from He's uh, prominent in um, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition. It's a book I read on this channel. 1463 to 1494, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, 1486 to 1535, Athanasius Kircher, 1602 to 1680, and Christian Nor von Rosenroth, 1636 to 1689. Rosenroth's Kabbalah Denudata was in fact a premier source text for the Golden Dawn, and several of its illustrations ended up in the diagrams of the Outer Order Advancement Ceremonies, see figure 8. In this book, one may find the writings of S. Abraham Cohen de Herrera, amongst others, whose systems present a blending of Neoplatonism with Kabbalah, along with Islamic philosophy and Christian Kabbalah. Cohen de Herrera received his Kabbalah from Israel Sarug, who was a disciple of Isaac Luria. Thus, the Kabbalah Denu Data is replete with Lurianic teachings, which together with the Sabbatian influence, influences gives the Golden Dawn a solid foundation in tradition. And in this context, we have to remember that the Sabbatian Kabbalah, as developed by Nathan of, Grace, uh, of Gaza, is a direct continuation of the teachings of Isaac Luria. Figure 8 is an illustration from the Kabbalah Denu Data. Now, as we have established the fact that there actually exists an esoteric transmission between the Sabbatian Kabbalah and the Golden Dawn, we should ask ourselves in which ways this school of thought has survived to this day through the Golden Dawn tradition. First, and foremost, I would say, that this could be discerned by the non-dogmatic approach towards spirituality in the Golden Dawn. This may be explained by the, sim by the extremely antinomian nature of the Frankist Kabbalah and its vehement revolt against religion, but there are lots of more traces of the Sabbatian Kabbalah to be found in the symbol system of the Golden Dawn something that will soon become obvious to the reader. Taking the above-mentioned facts into consideration, it becomes clear that the Frankist Kabbalah blends very well with the Hermetic Rosicrucian tradition because of its strong ties with Christianity. As a matter of fact, Jacob Frank and his followers... You know, I, I want to say something, by the way. Um, all this stuff points to a much more rich history between Hermeticism and Christianity and the interweaving between all of those two schools of thought and Gnosticism has not been mentioned a lot here, but sort of there's been some Gnostic elements to all this. So when someone like James Lindsay, do you guys know who that is? Like um, go on YouTube if you don't know who I'm talking about. And he ties Hermeticism with uh, Marxism and then his whole anti-Marxism claim, which I think I, I've listened to a lot of his content. He's pretty knowledgeable on diversity, equity, and inclusion and how all that comes from Marxism and it's tr it's like a, the state trying to influence the rest of you know society and, and force people down a certain way, and that's why Biden and his um, his you know uh, the cognitively 
impaired president is being taken over by the diversity, equity, inclusion people. Um, so I'm trying to make this like into a modern day, you know, James Lindsay tries to take all the hermetic tradition and apply it, you know, as above, so below and all that, all that stuff as a Marxist thing. And, uh, he calls it like, you know, black magic and, uh, the, the Freemasons and secret societies. And I just don't, when I was reading through it or listening to his lectures, he has a lot of things right, but he's he's discounting the the rich history, and I don't know anything either. But I'm I just know that he's not. I don't think Hermeticism is the boogeyman that someone like James Lindsay makes it out to be. So that's what I wanted to say. I'll I have to find a way to communicate this out on my channel without it buried. Uh, however many minutes into this a video like this 35 minutes into a video i'll figure it out later make it into a tiktok <laughs> all right let's keep going where were we um very well with the hermetic rosicrucian tradition because of its strong ties with christianity as a matter of fact jacob frank and his followers adored the holy mother the virgin mary the Virgin of Czestokwa, or Black Madonna of Poland, which Frankists associated with Shekhina, the cult of the Black Madonna as a form of worship of the divine feminine, and in reference to the Kabbalistic theory on the parts zufim, or countenances, it thus blended well with the Sabbatian Frankist movement also in virtue of its sexual mysticism. We know that Jacob Frank was a devout worshiper of the divine feminine, which is easily discernible in one of his sayings. In a dream in Setokowa, I saw the goddess who came to me appearing as a beautiful virgin. But it's no surprise that the Polish Sabbatian Kabbalah could blend so well with the regional Catholic faith and the worship of the Virgin Mary as the Frankist take on Kabbalah can be considered to be a sp species of a Christian Kabbalah, but in this instance it is the, the Jew which embraces Christian mysticism, not the other way around, like with Pico della Mirandola of the Italian school of Hermetic Kabbalah. As the Sabbatian Kabbalah initially blended with Islam through the holy apostasy of Shabtai Zevi, Jacob Frank likewise encouraged his followers to embrace Christianity in its messianic mission, as it considered the religion of Christ to be an intermediate stage towards a new form of messianic religion. It even considered Poland as a substitute for Jerusalem for the place of the ascent, hence it being labeled as her heretic in the eyes of a contemporary Judom. As residents of Poland, it was only natural for them to embrace the peculiar cult of the Virgin Mary, which no doubt blends naturally with the Kabbalistic view on sexual polarity. No wonder then that the inner alchemy, which, with its emphasis on the Venusian current, took a prominent place amongst the Asiatic brethren. It's no surprise either that Frankist Kabbalah was chosen to blend with Rosicrucianism considering the Christian natures of both. And in figure nine, you see the black Madonna of Setzt Ochoa. The virgin of Setzt Ochoa is a reference to a, the painting often called the black Madonna, which is held in the Polish castle and monastery of Setzt Ochoa. This image is a true icon of the Polish nation and people. And she is taken through several cities and villages on an annual cult-like journey where she is worshipped in an almost pagan fashion. In Poland, the worship of the Mother of God is very prominent as she is said to have appeared in different parts of Poland and effectively selecting the Poles as her chosen people. As a young child with ancestry in Poland, I heard a story told by one of my Polish relatives which is quite fascinating and says a lot of of the beliefs held in the minds of the common Polish people. During the war with Sweden in the 17th century, the Swedish army under Karl X. Gustav held a siege on the castle Ches 
Sestochoa. It is generally believed that the Swedish officer took his sword and stabbed the Black Madonna twice in her chin. The two scars are easily seen in the image. See figure 9. Let's take a look. Okay. Like right here. Interesting. It is generally believed by Poles that the two wounds are wandering towards the throat. When they reach it, the apocalypse will be, in fact, if, if it hasn't been prevented by prayer, a responsibility that is the lot of the Polish people. That the Virgin Mary often is conflated with the woman of the apocalypse in the same manner as Christ is identified with the Alpha et Omega in the Book of Revelation may be clearly perceived in the icon which is in my possession, see figure 10. This particular icon was purchased in Poland in the 1960s by my Polish parents. It is typical of Polish iconography to frame a phonograph of a picture of the Virgin Mary with an image as shown below. But in the case, in this case, the imagery makes clear reference to the woman in the Revelation, which appeared as a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Figure 10, Madonna as the woman of the apocalypse. Thus, she can really be seen to be the divine mother and the Kabbalistic Pertzufik holy trinity of father, mother, and son. All of this makes a very interesting connection to the diagram of the golden of the Garden of Eden before the fall, taken from the grade of Practicus of the Golden Dawn in the outer, and the agent angelic female figure surmounting this diagram, see figure 11. This image expresses the divine feminine, the holy Kabbalah referred to as Aima Elohim, which may be translated as the mother of God. Through the imagery... <laughs> She directly corresponds to the woman of the apocalypse from the 12th century of the book of Revelation, as quoted above. I further believe that the, the dynamics between the Virgin Mary and the woman of the apocalypse is a very interesting subject. The former being earthly, fallen, and in matter, tra entrapped, lesser version of the greater mother, as represented by the latter. In the diagram below, the lesser mother is rep represented by the feminine figure, Eve, at the base of the cross holding the two pillars, serving as the foundation of existence. Okay, so figure 11 is the diagram of the Garden of Eden before the fall. So you have this, Eve, Adam, the two pillars. This is uh, the tree of life, because you have the left side, the right side, the middle pillar, and then... Okay, you have all that. That's interesting. However, the truly unique development and clearly antinomian part of Sabbatian Kabbalah is the acknowledgement of the evil and demonic as equal parts of God, as the good and angelic. It proposes the concept of divine ambivalence, even on the level of Ein Sof, or the no thing. Ein Sof according to Nathan of Gaza, consists of two kinds of light, the thoughtful and the thoughtless. The former is in favor of creation, the latter trying to hinder it and conserve the original state of blissful nothingness. This latter light is thoughtless because it lacks the image necessary for creation. The zim zum, or retraction, which created cosmos out of light, occurred within the thoughtful light, which thought its creative intention was able to emanate in light towards the first monad, or kether. But as a result of all this, the thoughtless light was also dragged down in the process of creation, which because of its limiting nature tried to prevent it. This created the dialectics between the positively creative force and a destructive power. Personally, I compare these original impulses with the life and death drives of Sigmund Freud, the latter manifesting as an atavistic drive of regression into the blissful state <coughs> of the womb, 
the former the drive of individuation and progress into adulthood. These two conflicting divine intentions of the macrocosm, which also is reflected in the microcosm, manifests as the two pillars of Kabbalah, which is which in the golden dawn are painted as black and white to further their polarity and association with the two kinds of light. See figure 11. This state or nature of Godhead is also indicated by the adoration of the Lord of the universe, which states that he is the Lord of the light and of the darkness. Nathan of Gaza also originated the concept of the infernal abyss filled with serpents set out to destroy creation also in Zoharic terms called Sitra Ara, or the other side, the world of shells or clipoth, situated below the supernals of the tree of life, in which the thoughtless light resides. See figure 12. This clearly refers to the red dragon symbolism of the golden dawn, which can be seen in the diagrams of the Garden of Eden before and after the fall from Practicus and Philosophus, grades respectively see figure 11 and 12. so here we have figure 11 the diagram of the garden of eden after the fall okay this red dragon is related to the lesser mother in the image seen as descended into hell or citra ara proper represented by the circle with seven spheres at the bottom of the tree of life. See figure 12. Thus, the dragon power is properly speaking a symbolical representation of the impulse of the fallen and lessened mother to ascend and reunite with her consort at the supernal Eden. The red dragon with seven heads is, of course, another reference to the book of Revelation, which states that there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten thorns, and seven crowns upon his head. It is also to be found on the floor of the vault of Adepti, see figure 13. Reading the teachings of the golden dawn regarded the red dragon, one becomes struck with the controversial contents of its antinomian teaching, where the goal of the adept is to ride upon the back of the dragon, harness the forces of evil, and gain strength therefrom. All right, so does is that kind of saying that the Golden Dawn and Masonic is evil, riding the forces of evil to strengthen it uh, and, and ride the Red Dragon? That's sort of how I'm interpreting that. Um, you guys tell me what your interpretation is, but, um, you know, I've thought about should I get involved with any of this stuff? And when I read a sentence like that, it, it steers me towards no. So I just, the, the easiest thing is just become a, a scholar of all this. Just read through it like we're doing. Um, save judgment for later, but just trying to interpret it um, in a way that makes sense to me. All right, thanks for sticking through uh, to this point if you guys are still with me 48 minutes in. So appreciate it. It, it must be your, mean you're interested in all this stuff uh, like I am. All right. This concept also has its equivalent in the Soharic concept of the rider of the serpent. Figure 13 is the floor of the vault of the Adepti. The Golden Dawn teachings concerning the fall and the Garden of Eden concerns the process which leads to the breaking of the vessels. Note that the diagram of the Garden of Eden after the fall, see figure 12, depicts the three of life in the form of cross which only contains the seven lowest sephiroth and doth, which indicates the center of the cross, and at the mercy of the red dragon. According to Nathan of Gaza, the only part of the three of life, it's supposed to be tree of life? Three, it says three, three of life, which is saved from the attacks of the dragon, is the supernal which is symbolized by the great circle, because of it being protected by the four elemental cherubim, and the flaming sword which God placed there for the protection of the garden. According to Nathan, this is the place of the thoughtful light upon the tree of life. According to Nathan, the creation below the abyss is in a hopeless condition that only can be restored by a messianic figure. This is a reference to the new Adam 
in the philosophy of the Golden Dawn, which is said to be able to reclaim his throne in Tifareth and rule with his rod of iron, a clear reference to the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. The Messiah is the offspring of the fatherly Chokma, wisdom, and the motherly Bina, understanding, Abba and Ima, the thoughtful light and the thoughtless light, respectively. Together they can beget the created world below the abyss, but also its redeemer, the Messiah, that can be seen as being represented by Doth, knowledge. Doth is both involved with the fall, but simultaneously also constitutes its highest point and the intermediary between the supernal triad and the fallen universe. <clears throat> The Messiah, according to Nathan, stands above the law of Torah and cannot be judged by the common criteria of morality concerning what is good and what is evil. As the redeemer of the fallen world and the intermediary link between that which is above and that which is below the abyss, he must also become part of its fallen condition. Thus he must descend into the pit of snakes, and in the diagrams of the Garden of Eden before and after the fall, he is represented by the crucified man, Adam, who partakes in the fall of Eve. Oh, guys, this is um, an interesting um, reference to uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion, the anime. You can find it on Netflix right now. I've been re-watching it for the second time. It's like a great anime from the 90s. They, um, the, the synopsis, I'm not going to spoil anything, just watch it, but, uh, you know, it's in the future in japan the apocalypse has happened these weird aliens called angels come and um destroy japan and this young guy um has to uh, you know they they capture one of the angels and they put him on a cross and they call it adam and um through that they create uh evangelion which are like uh these mega uh these uh mecha things that the japanese people like love you know the animes they love to do that so they jump in these like you know um things and go fight the angels and so this is a clear reference to all this stuff which is kind of interesting like who would have thought that's <laughs> that's just like i just think that's so interesting um if you watch the intro you'll see lots of uh kabbalistic references and tree of life into neon genesis evangelion so just go back and watch it you'll see what i'm talking about um all right the fall of eve nathan explains that the soul of the messiah as well as ours constitutes both the thoughtless light and the thoughtful light in his mission he cleanses and redeems the fallen ones but becomes himself unclean and fallen in the process he is according to nathan the holy serpent which subdues the serpents of the abyss which reminds us of the numerical concordance with between the word Mashia, the anointed, and Nahash, serpent. This is clearly shown forth in the Adeptist minor grade and the lid of Pastos, in the vault of the Adepti, in the image of the Messiah subduing the serpents of dragon of the infernal abyss, see figure 14, the image of the lid of Pastos. Now this brings us to the sixth Sephira of Tipareth, Tifareth, which has a central position in both the Sabbatian doctrine and in the Golden Dawn. It refers to Zaire Anpin, Microprosopus, which by Nathan was conceptualized as Malka Kadisha, or the Holy King, in his aspect as united with his queen, the Shekinah. It is also called the God of Faith by Nathan. Nathan speaks of the scorch of T Tifereth, or the lights of Iana Yakira, the precious tree at the level of at Zeluth, the highest of Kabbalistic worlds, created by the harmonious union of the thoughtful light and the thoughtless light. This union is considered necessary, since the thoughtless light has the powers of creation, whereas the thoughtless light, in spite of its desire to create, is impotent and has to employ the creative forces of the thoughtless light. This light of the God of faith 
is then emanated downwards through the other three Kabbalistic worlds, being part of the abyss of serpents. This emanated force is called Mana Yakira, and is used by the thoughtful light to subdue the serpents. This light also incarnates in the Messiah, elevating him to a godhead, the god of faith. As a matter of fact, Nathan explained off Zabatai Zevi's manic depressive disorder in these terms, that he is, in his own person, united both the thoughtful and the thoughtless lights, the former being the manic phases, while the latter marking the depressive states of the Messiah. Figure 15, Harpocrates, the god of silence. Lastly, we find in the Frankist Kabbalah also the notion of Masa Duma, the work of silence, which has a clear relationship to the god form of Harpocrates, the god of silence of the Golden Dawn and also of Freemasonry. Jacob Frank has been quoted in the Dicta of the Lord, a collection of Frank's sayings, as stating, the gods of Freemasonry, i.e. Freemasonry, will have to do which those two did. The first of these two being Shabbatai Zevi and the second Baru Chia Rousseau, who Frank repeatedly referred to as the first light. Uh, the first and the second avatars, sorry. Thus, there may be a direct correspondence between the pledge of the secrecy of Freemasonry and the Frankist Massa Duma, perhaps even referring to Freemasonic Frankists. So now, what can we learn from the Sabbatian and especially the Frankist tradition, and position to further understand the Golden Dawn tradition. Above all, that the Golden Dawn neither is nor ever should become a religion. The Golden Dawn is a spiritual science and art, which makes use of certain religious symbols, predominantly Christian, but it has nothing to do with the religious dogma. Adepts of our tradition should always maintain the integrity of spiritual independence towards organized religion. But at the same time, we must remember the admonition of the neophyte grade to revere all religions as containing a spark of spiritual truth. No religion is truer than the other. No religions, of whatever flavor, can ever contain the whole truth about God. To truly see God, we must forsake religion to see beyond the mental projections of common man that governs the consensus image of him. Man, in fact, has God created into his own image. He was created out of man's fear of punishment and out of guilt. To see God, we must let go of all preconceived notions about his true nature. We must let go of all guilt and the cultural consensus ideas about the nature of sin. We must embrace God as children, pure and undefiled, mentally and spiritually speaking. This is the true significance of Sabbatian antinomianism. Postscript. Was Jacob Frank a Rosicrucian? The facts as presented above tell us plainly that Jacob Frank's cousin Thomas von Schoenfield, a.k.a. Moses Dobrushka, or Junius Frey, was one of the founding members of the Asiatic Brethren. This compelling evidence clearly shows us the strong link between the Kabbalistic Frankist movement on one hand and the Rosicrucian Asiatic Brotherhood on the other. The next logical step is to ask ourselves if this di indirect link between the Frankist and Rosicrucian movements maintained by the intermediary of the cousin von Schoenfeld was all there was all that there is to it, or if there also may have existed a more direct connection. Was Jacob Frank himself perhaps a Rosicrucian initiate? Figure 16, the Golden Rosy Cross. First of all, it must again be made clear that there were two great Rosicrucian fraternities in Germany, the Asiatic Brethren and the Golden Rosy Cross, the former being a schismatic offshoot of the latter, created in 1780 by Hans Heinrich von Ecker and Eckenhoff, an ex-member and initiate of the Golden Rosy Cross, together with Hebrew Kabbalists such as Ephraim Hirschfeld and Thomas von Schoenfeld. He created the Asiatic Brethren as a much more eclectic version 
of Rosicrucianism compared to the more professed Christian esoteric and pietistic orientation of the golden rosy cross. cross. If Jacob Frank was to belong to anyone of these two big name orders, he would naturally have been a member of the former, but was he actually? We do know that Frank was engaged in alchemical practices. In his book, Jacob Frank, The End of the Sabbatean Heresy, Alexander Croucher discusses Frank's alchemical activities in Brun, or Borno, Moravia, between mid-1770s to 1789. Frank's activities involved alchemy, successfully persuading his followers that there were certain herbs that, when spread over iron, transmuted that metal into gold, also that there was a certain substance giving eternal life. Before the element of magic was used by Frank in an attempt to practice alchemy for the purpose of creating gold, the master passed for a doctor, restoring health to the sick by the use of means known only to him. When he was feeling better, he began to think about ways to locate new sources of income, to create gold through alchemy. He reminded himself how he had toiled over alchemy with rabbis Issachar and Mordecai. He gathered his brothers and encouraged them to pursue the knowledge of how to make gold. At Frank's court, there began the preparation of gold drops as a medication for all diseases. But this fascinating account of Jacob Frank's dabbling with alchemy does not present any actual proof of him being a Rosicrucian. Alchemy was very popular in Germany toward, during the 18th century, as opposed to France, where the Enlightenment had ended the openly practice of the royal art, which by now had become superseded by modern science. But the situation was very different in Germany, where alchem alchemy prevailed and probably were as big as homeopathy as today in 21st century Germany. So, even if the practice of alchemy was a sign of the true Rosicrucian, most alchemists probably were not. So we have no proof yet of Jacob Frank being a Rosicrucian, even if the plausibility finally has been raised. Now, throughout this essay, I have had the benefit of valuable pointers being made, and references given by the Sabbatian Kabbalists and the Hermetic scholar Olin Rush. Nowhere has he been a more helpful recourse than regarding this question of Jacob Frank's involvement with the Asiatics. He has also asserted me that Jacob Frank and many of his followers were involved in Freemasonry and has furthermore presented some fascinating information which corroborates M. Croucher's findings. Mr. Rush asserts that not only did Frank practice alchemy, but also that he owned several alchemical laboratories, first in Brun and later in Offenbach. In the Dicta of the Lord, Jacob Frank instructed, instructs, instruct his disciples, ma minimum, thus, just as the entire world seeks and wishes to make gold, so I wish to transmute you to refined gold. Mr. Rush refers to yet another tradition, which states that Chaim ben Joseph Vital, who was the disciple of Isaac Luria and recorded the latter, latter's teachings, also practiced alchemy. His son, Shmuel, was, who preserved the Lurian teachings and his father's writings, was a guest for some time at the Egyptian home of the Chelebi Raphael Joseph, whose family were Sabbateans. There was also a strong Arabic alchemical presence in northern Africa, particularly in Fez, Morocco, and there was also some crossover to Jewish alchemy, according to Mr. Olin, as late as in the 1920s. Remembering that Jacob Frank was at close ties with the Turkish Danma, there's also a possibility of an influence from the Muslim Bektashi Sufi tradition and also from activities of the Donma in certain guilds, perhaps even with Freemasonic connections. Furthermore, in studies of the Kabbalistic alchemical treatise, Aish Mezareth, The Purifying Fire, which on several accounts resembles some of Vital's descriptions, one needs a Luriatic outlook to unlock its message. 
So here we have established the idea of a strong alchemical tradition behind or parallel with the Lurian and Sabbatian Kabbalah through Rabbi Chaim Vital, who according to Mr. Rush wrote on the subject of alchemy, and Chelebi Raphael Joseph, the latter bringing a possible link of a Jewish, i.e. non-Rosicrucian, alchemical transmission between the Lurianic and Sabbatian Kabbalah. We already know that Jacob Frank was, in fact, working with alchemical processes for the 10-year period while in Brunn, and then afterwards also in Offenbach. These facts alone make, surely make his brand of Kabbalah suited for mixing with the Rosicrucian alchemical tradition. But still nothing of this is any proof of Jacob Frank being an actual initiate of the Rosicrucian tradition in the real sense of the word. What's interesting enough What's interesting, though, is that I myself have seen many parallels between Lurianic, Kabbalah, and the alchemy, having knowledge of both systems. Arziel is very alchemical in his exposition of the Klippoth and the description of the Restoration, which indeed can be compared to the alchemical pr principle of Solve et Coagula. The freeing of the sparks is clearly analogical with the sublimation of sulfur and mercury and the purification of the salt from the caput mortem, the latter actually representing the klipoth. Thus, Lurianic Kabbalah comes into new light or becomes easier understood through the analogy of alchemy and spaggery. So all these obvious connections, both in history and in theory, has now established a clear alchemical nature in Lurianic Kabbalah, which was transmitted to the Sabbatian and especially Frankist Kabbalah. But again, what all of this proves is that there has always existed a Hebrew alchemical tradition, at least through analogy, parallel to the Hermetic Rosicrucian alchemical tradition. But could there also have been a connection between these two in some points of history? It, it's very likely that Jacob Frank, at the very least, was involved in some form of Freemasonry, as he made references to it in his writings, such as the one previously quoted, I furthermore found a very interesting reference to a Freemasonic lodge made by Professor Harris Lenovitz. In 1786, having bankrupted Brun, he, i.e. Jacob Frank, moved to Offenbach and carried on in the same manner, appearing in public but always in a state of pomp and ceremony and in an exotic costume. He was the pet of the Prince of Jessenberg. During the years in Brunn and Offenbach, Frank was closely tied to the founders of the Freemasonic Lodge, known as the Asiatic Brothers, contributing ideas to their constitution and adopting some of the practices, garb, and style of Freemasonry. So here we find ourselves back to the main subject matter of the Asiatic Brethren. If Professor Lenovitz is correct about this information, Jacob Frank was directly involved with the founding and operation of the Rosicrucian Society, which were created six years prior to him moving to Offenbach. No wonder then he practiced alchemy in Brunn and Offenbach. The Asiatic Brethren continued the Rosicrucian alchemical tradition of the Golden Rosy Cross, at least to some extent. So considering these facts as presented by Professor Lenovitz, we must conclude that Jacob Frank not only practiced alchemy, for at least a decade, but that he himself was also most probably was a Rosicrucian initiate. Fine. Oh, thank God we got to that conclusion. All right, that's it. Okay, thanks for sticking with me. Uh, I found a lot of that interesting. Hope you did too. Um, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.